gotten. I've gotten very late. All right, we're starting our lecture on deep confidence. Here we go. Thank you, everybody. So confidence is feeling of self-assurance rising from, look at this, appreciating one's own abilities or qualities or gifts. We could call them gifts, but they're not only gifts because you develop them as skills. And we could say that self-esteem is self-respect, accepting and liking oneself. <clears throat> I think that we could also say that um, self, we could say that self-esteem is when we come through for ourselves. Like when we say we're gonna do something and we follow up and we do it. That's how we build our own sense of self-respect, right? Um, so we want to try to be honest with ourselves about what we can do and work to do that. <clears throat> Okay, so here we have a question. What are three things that you feel confident about? Three things that you respect and appreciate about yourself. Okay, so write those down on a piece of paper and then type one of them in the chat. <clears throat> now you could say these are three gifts or three skills that you've developed. but three things that you respect and appreciate about yourself. For me, one of them is that I'm loving. <clears throat> now, there are always things that we don't respect about ourselves. And of course, those we can work to change. But one of the things that Seligman, remember, he's the learned helplessness to learn optimist guy. One of the things that his research realized is that Putting a hyper emphasis on what's wrong with us tends to inflame the red brain and actually inhibit growth and progress. So um, what they realized is that putting our attention on what's right with us expressing and using that as gifts for the world and then also using those strengths to help us move forward and tweak and hone and adapt what isn't right with us or what we want to fix or change. Um, those things, applying our strengths and what we're good at to help us get better at our weaknesses is the way to go. So we want to begin to soften. These are beautiful things that you're saying, being respectful, resilient, your mind, your love of animals, these gifts, these qualities, these abilities, these are wonderful things to appreciate. So when you think about confidence, it's interesting to reflect on what led, leads to our sense of confidence. So jot down a short list of things that lead to your sense of confidence in those areas, right? So three things you feel confident about is what we were writing. So what do you think led to your sense of confidence, right? And for me, I think two things. One is that um, led to my confidence and loving. One is that I'm really good at it because I practice it a lot. And the other one is that I get a lot of positive feedback for it, right? So I get a lot of reinforcement. I have a lot of confidence in my ability to vacuum <laughs> because my mom tricked me into vacuuming all the time when I was a little kid by telling me I was the best one at it. And I got an enormous amount of practice, right? <laughs> so there's many things that we can notice that we do have confidence in. We wanna be able to notice those, not just the ones where we don't. Those are where we can build. But again, we want to begin by really If you could imagine that you were feeling the confidence, the good, the the um, the goodness 
that it feels to be able to do these things, these skills and abilities that you have developed. If that, if you were awash in those feelings and, and while awashed in those feelings, you approach the world and challenges of the world. You see, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about really taking it in. You know, Rick Hansen talks a lot about taking it in and it's not taking it in so you can be arrogant because the irony is that people who are arrogant are actually insecure. That's why they overdo it. Everybody knows this. I mean, the, the, the research is completely conclusive on this. There's no, anybody who studies people knows. And, and people are drawn to false confidence because, you know, we sometimes call it charisma because, um, it, because we want it, because we want, because that feeling of I can do no wrong is very seductive, but the feeling that I can do no wrong is also a lie. So having some self-doubt is a very important part of wisdom. At the same time, we do wanna walk through life feeling awash with gratitude for the gifts that we have and the skills we have developed, we have work to build that we can then offer as gifts to society and the world, right? And approach our challenges, really feel owning, stepping into the ownership of those things. So we gain confidence, we get good at stuff um, through learning repeated practice and experience. So it takes learning and repeated practice and experience for us to get good at stuff, right? That's the growth mindset. We got to put the time in and putting the time in takes effort. We have to work at it. And we have a, in the back of our minds, we have a tendency to think, and we've been over this before. We have a tendency to think that if I, if I have to work at it, then I'm no good at it. But we've learned that that is wrong, that that is a fixed mindset. And we've also learned intriguingly that it is in the effort moment that we are making the leap of learning. It's in the push. It's in the push. And I think that the metaphor for um, this is Rocky, right? For anybody who recognizes the scene, but the, the metaphor for um, at first running up the stairs, incredibly hard, but after just takes a lot of effort to do it, but he built and built and built it, right? So effort is the learning edge. Now here's Andrew Huberman, one of my favorite psychologists, he's got an incredibly fantastic podcast. He's at Stanford. Deliberate action feels hard. The hard part is the part that is actually changing your brain. So it's the same with exercise, right? It's that pushing a little bit past. You don't want to push too far past and, you know, blow your tendons and all that, you know, then we get frustrated and we throw the books and things like that. And that happening now and again is, is okay, but it happening regularly is not good. As you're in the hard part, tell yourself, this is the good part. This is the part that gives me energy and makes me change. So what we want to do is become comfortable with uh, effort. You know, effort has this, I don't feel good. <laughs> I don't want to put out the effort kind of energy to it. But what we want to do is completely shift that mindset and literally anyway. So this is Huberman, and you can see he does a lot of these talks. He's fantastic. And he'll have a lot of interesting things to say on here if you want to watch the whole thing. Almost through what seem like trivial things, like making your bed or making the cup of coffee. Okay, but it's here we go. Kind of a hard day. It, it's not enough. I felt like there was something else there. So I asked him, he said, well, it's very interesting because part of it is about not just making your bed, but it's the things you're not doing by making your bed. You're not lying in bed and ruminating. Mm. You're not back on your heels. And that's, on your phone. That's right. Yeah. When, so when you look at, and you have spent a lot of time with people in mm. high-performing communities, mainly through some consulting work, but what you find is that, you know, we can all be either be back on our heels, flat-footed or forward center of mass. Forward, yeah. And when you look at people who are in these high-performance communities, they try and keep their center of mass forward. Almost 
through what seem like trivial things like making your bed or making the cup of coffee. But it's not just oh, about yeah, what you're doing. Like, yeah. It's all the things you're not doing that can put you down the path of ruminating or put you down the path of um, unhealthy behavior. So the key to this is if we want to be very concrete, we should probably focus on actions. And I'll use mm -hmm. fitness as an example because it translates to everybody, whereas you know, people's circumstances sure. different. Let's say somebody really wants to take on a fitness routine. They hate running or they want to lose weight in a, in a healthy way, this kind of thing. So we've all heard the example, well, you put your shoes by the door on day one, day two, you put them on day three, you go out the door, day four, you walk around the block and then, you know, and then eventually like they're running marathons. <laughs> okay, <laughs> great. But to sustain that behavior or even to make the, the behavior pleasurable and to give you energy, the key is to subjectively reward those steps. So it's not going to be, mm. let's say I go out and I run a mile. And my goal is to run 10 miles in a few weeks. The key is as you're in the strain of that mile, the hard part, you want to tell yourself, this is the good part. This is the part that gives me energy. And I'll be very surprised if people don't actually feel like they could continue further. So it's a journey of a thousand miles starts with the single is made up of, you know, single steps, but the key is to reward the harder steps, not the easier ones and not the ones where you get the thing that you want. Don't reward yourself for putting your shoes on and taking a step outside. You could if that was a huge barrier for you. It was very hard. If it was very hard for you. But running the 10 miles that's is hard. hard. Find the wall and push a little bit further through that wall and reward that process. So this is why I think reps in the gym, the, the final reps, like reps to failure, are usually not the best example. First of all, most people aren't doing reps to failure and it doesn't mm -hmm. translate to young kids and stuff where they probably shouldn't be doing heavy re yeah, reps yeah. to failure, this kind of thing. What you want, however, is if you're going to go there to think about these are the this is the hard part because that's when adrenaline, norepinephrine are getting maxed out, and that's when you have an opportunity to bring dopamine in and teach those neural pathways to slam that back mm -hmm. down. And I don't want to um, highlight them too much because they are a very niche and specialized community. But you look at people in special operations, you look at the um, process, like the whole um, evaluation process of who gets in and who doesn't. It's really about putting people into stress and seeing who can not just make it through that stress, but buffer that stress, reward the process through teamwork, reward the process of stress through some internal dialogue that has everything to do with not being back on your heels, not being flat footed, but center of mass forward. And I should also be clear, I'm not talking about everybody being super aggro and always like, you know, work, work, work. Yeah. In fact, if you're spending too much epinephrine, if you're too much of an adrenaline junkie, you will burn out eventually burn out. unless you can find ways to recover yourself or to buffer that with dopamine. And okay. So, so what's, what he's saying here is completely reinforcing. He's completely reinforcing what Kelly was saying. It's a whole nother way of saying what Kelly was saying. This is a great dialogue happening in the chat um, that when we, that if we can recognize and say, okay, this is the part that's good, you know, like with the stress response, I, I find it so interesting to notice, you know, this, this energy in my body is, is, is trying to help and support me galvanize the energy to face this challenge. And I can appreciate it. And I can almost sense everything relaxing, right? Because it says that I can manage this stress right i can manage this feeling i can work with this feeling and here what he's saying is that we want to be really honoring of that effort that that experience of putting in putting in the push right putting in the push while not completely overdoing it we, we don't want to get completely overdoing it human has got a whole series of talks on that our brain needs to zoom in and it needs to zoom out right and the zoom out is play relaxation big picture creativity real, you know so effort means that we're getting stronger right so this is a reframe this is a shape shift on how we reflect on and interpret effort because we can interpret effort as i don't like this feeling this isn't as pleasurable as kicking back on the couch right so instead we're really we're wrapping we're wrapping this in a whole new package for ourselves this is the moment I'm actually getting, we can learn to fall in love with effort. Effort is when our brain actually grows. We really want to learn to fall in love with effort. And he talked about this idea of subjective rewards. He has a, 
goal to write a book, which he's, he describes as really hard for him. So his subjective reward in his head is, as long as I'm writing, I'm on the right path. And it's for him, it's writing a little bit every day, right? So think of something you want to become more confident about or more self-assured about, or you want to see yourself doing more frequently. You can ask, what is a subjective reward you can say to yourself when the effort moment is strong? This is this can often be attributed to schoolwork when people are a student. You know, um, I'm I'm on, as long as I'm blank, I'm on the right path. I'm on the right path as long as I am dot dot dot. Right. So this is your idea, your standard of the amount of effort you need to see yourself be willing to do. Okay. <clears throat> so as long as I'm blank, I'm on the right path. As long as I'm exercising every day, as long as I'm um, spending an hour a day doing X, right? So, it's a really helpful phrase, subjective rewards. That means reinforcing yourself, <laughs> you know, saying this is the moment that I'm getting better at it. This is the moment that I'm getting strong, right? Shape shifting the perceptual interpretation of the experience rather than efforts of pain in the ass. I don't want to do it. So neuroplasticity Plasticity is triggered by some effort and solidified by sleep and deep rest. We talked about that, right? So we build the neurons and we really need to get that deep rest. When we experience too much frustration and strain, we need to add play. Play resets our brain, enhances learning and fostered connection. Play is the source of bonding. You want to get close with somebody, an animal, a kid, or an adult, find ways to play. Everybody has ways to play everybody has ways that they play whether it's going on a hike watching a sport game right playing video games find the ways to play and tune in going shopping what are the ways to play right laughing watching comedy and then expand them and um, explore different ways to play <clears throat> Okay, a second way we can grow confidence is to appreciate our strengths and respect what we have learned and gained rather than dismiss what we have learned and gained, which means absorbing and taking in compliments, giving the person the gift of receiving their confident compliment, right? Rather than, oh gosh, you're so pretty. Oh, no, I'm not, you know? I always used to tell my son, you don't get to take credit for being pretty. You just get to appreciate it. So appreciate it. We often under acknowledge the strengths we have gained from our life experiences. In 10 things successful people do not do, one of the main things successful people do not do is dismiss their strengths, okay? Instead, they recognize them as gifts to share. So Lori Santos taught us that there is no point comparing ourselves with others because these comparisons are useless and inaccurate. They don't tell the whole story. All of our stories are more complex than that. So this is a really cool little video that shows us the power of reframing. This is a um, slam poet named Ka Katie Nakai. Reframing is changing the way we think about something. And it's a big part of therapy. So people, we spend a lot of time in therapy helping to re reframe interpretations of things so that expand them, make them bigger, more accurate, so that we can actually have a sort of a, it transforms our experience. So here, Katie McKay is doing a slam poet on, on the word pretty and the idea of pretty and the obsession with being pretty, okay? So this is, of course, a cultural mindset that um, gets exacerbated in the media. And so it becomes a head trip. And, uh, or it can easily become a head trip. And here she just blasts it apart. Watch her blast apart the paradigm, the old paradigm of pretty. Here we go. When I was just a little girl. Cuss words, my mother, fair warning. Will I be pretty? Will I be pretty? Will I be pretty? What comes next? Oh, right. 
Will I be rich, which is almost pretty depending on where you shop. And the pretty question infects from conception, passing blood and breath into cells. The word hangs from our mother's hearts in a shrill fluorescent floodlight of worry. Will I be wanted, worthy, pretty? That's puberty left me this funhouse mirror dryad, teeth set at science fiction angles, crooked nose, face donkey long and pockmarked where the hormones went finger painting my poor mother how could this happen you'll have porcelain skin as soon as we can see a dermatologist you sucked your thumb that's why your teeth look like that you were hit in the face with a frisbee when you were six otherwise your nose would have been just fine don't worry we'll get it all fixed she would say grasping my face twisting it this way then that as though it were a cabbage she might buy but this is not about her not her fault she too was raised to believe the greatest asset she could bestow upon her awkward little girl was a marketable facade by 16 i was pickled with ointments medications peroxides teeth corralled into steel prongs laying in a hospital bed face packed with gauze cushioning the brand new nose the surgeon had carved Belly gorged on two pints of my own blood I had swallowed under anesthesia, and every convulsive twist of my gut like my body screaming at me from the inside out. What did you let them do to you? All the while, this never-ending chorus droning on and on like the IV needle dripping liquid beauty into my blood. Will I be pretty? Will I be pretty? Like my mother unwinding the gift wrap to reveal the bouquet of daughter her $10,000 bought her. Pretty. Pretty. And now I have not seen my own face in 10 years. I have not seen my own face in 10 years, but this is not about me. This is about the self-mutilating circus we have painted ourselves clowns in, about women who will prowl 30 stores and six malls to find the right cocktail dress, but who haven't a clue where to find fulfillment or how to wear joy, wandering through life shackled to a shopping bag beneath the tyranny of those two pretty syllables, about men wallowing on bar stools, drearily practicing attraction, and everyone who will drift home tonight crestfallen because not enough strangers found you suitably fuckable. This, this is about my own someday daughter. When you approach me, already stung, stained with insecurity, begging, Mom, will I be pretty? Will I be pretty? I will wipe that question from your mouth like cheap lipstick and answer, no. The word pretty is unworthy of everything you will be, and no child of mine will be contained in five letters. You will be pretty intelligent, pretty creative, pretty amazing, but you will never be. Merely pretty. So that's a reframe of the word pretty. And she does a great job with it, doesn't she? Um, helping us see it in a new way. Helping us change our interpretation of it. Yes, I totally agree that she's awesome. And the whole thing is because we get head tripped, we get psyched, like brainwashed really into overemphasizing this aspect of our being and other people's being too. And then we project it onto other people and we evaluate ourselves and other people. And, and basically at this point, pretty much everybody is pretty who takes care of themselves, you know, in a basic level, like is clean and, and, you know, uh, so we're really um, might as well get off that grandstand. And she does a wonderful job of showing how we can change, how, how that shape shifts our feeling about it inside. And that begins to open up a new way of responding to the whole idea of pretty. Like if we never forget that, we realize that it's just one piece and it doesn't have to be the piece or, <laughs> or even the biggest piece or even that important uh, piece. And in therapy and counseling, if we get stuck on not being able to shift how we see things like our past experiences, mistakes or resentments, one of the goals of counseling and therapy of quality counseling and therapy is help us reframe that so we can see it anew, just like Katie McKay did there with Pretty. Um, 
we all have flaws. Um, everybody does. There's virtually, you know, if you watch TVs, literature, stories, songs, everything is flawed. It's built into the system. So flawed is built into the system. So that's another thing you don't have to take quite so personally. You need to take res personal responsibility, it's your job, to manage the deck of cards you got. But it's a uh, but you don't have to take total personal, you know, it's not, you're not entirely in charge of why and how it's there. So one way that we can reframe how we think about things we went through the past is by being aware of the skills and ability that the challenges develop within us. And we talked about that a little bit with the stoic, um, the, the talking we did on the stoic way. So a third influence on our confidence is the encouragement, support, and praise we get from other people. One of the things we can take a moment to look at is why do we care so much about what other people think? And we're basically designed to because we're social creatures. So, so we live in a pack and we're designed to feel comforted being accepted by the pack. And um, most of us attribute that to our nuclear family and then our friends and then our larger community, right? So how much acceptance and how valued we feel by the pack, we're why it's wired into us to feel that way. <clears throat> we're also designed to feel kind of the opposite, to want autonomy and independence. One of the reasons why Katie McKay was so unhappy about the face surgery was not that she doesn't necessarily not like the results, but because she didn't choose it, because it wasn't coming from within her to do. And so that, you know, so then it feels like an affront, um, like, like someone, you know, um, forced themselves, their will upon the other. So we both have this yin yang of this desire to be part of the pack and also the desire to stand out from the pack and have our own autonomy. We live within the oscillation of that yin yang. So we do, we do have tendencies to care about what other people think. We have um, these tendencies, empathy, planning, language, compassion, cooperation, and morality, which are based on group needs is part of what this larger brain is doing, a huge part of what our larger brain is doing. So the larger brain of mammals is involved in these kinds of things and for humans, most of all, all right? So this assessment of the larger world and when we were tribal creatures, it was a matter of life or death, whether the tribe approves of, of us or not. You know, when you're alone in the wild um, in Africa, you're not gonna make it by yourself you just aren't. So um, the more social the mammal and the larger its group, the more brain power is devoted to the complexities of social relationships. Chimps groom each other and have all kinds of different ways to cooperate and build alliances. They even share food. Now, chimps live in tribes of about 50 members, and we're sort of, our brain is designed to manage a network of about 50 people too. Um, and that means interpersonal connections, not sort of long, you know, like five tiers out, um, but those ones that you're dealing with on the first, second, third, and fourth, you know, wave um, out, apart from you, like the people closest to you, then the next wave out, then the next wave out, then the next wave out. So we're designed to manage about the same number of people in terms of our social brain. So as our brain grew, so did the length of our childhood. So you notice that we have a very, very, very long childhood, very long childhood. I mean, kids can't run by themselves away from predators when they're until they're like four. And so this is where pair bonding and, and tribal cohesion came from is to support and protect each other. You know, deer and gazelles, they work in tribes too elephants. They work in small groups. So we're an interdependent species that learn to survive and thrive by cooperating and depending on each other. And, and in order to do that, we had to be able to read and sense 
whether other members of the tribe were going along with our ideas or not going along with those ideas. So having that radar for what the tribal members are thinking of us. But for most of our history, we would only interact with those within our tribe, which would tend to expand to about 50, maybe 150 people, and then it would splinter off and start another tribe. So um, <clears throat> we, uh, we're not, we're, the brains that we have were not built for dealing with the massive communication and information network that we're dealing with now. So we have, we're, we're adapting to it with our earlier brain. So as a social species, we have a core need to be respected and cared for by the tribe. So offering people respect and value, helping them feel value, turning toward them. These are all things that are really important to us and to others. And there can be lots of reasons why we didn't get quite enough of that in childhood and so that we can feel like later on in life that we're missing some of it. This is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And so here we're talking about love and belonging needs and then esteem needs, which is what you want to get good at so that you can offer those skills to the tribe, right? What you are going to get good at, the things you'd like to get good at. It's an interesting thought experiment to do. Um, to go, like, if you're trying to figure out what you want to do with your work or your life, to think about um, what are like five or 10 things I want to get good at? What do I want to get really good at over the next five years? That's a great thought experiment. What do I want to get good at over the next five years? Because we can get really good at something in five years. So Eric Erickson is a famous developmental psychologist. Developmental psychologists look at how we develop over the lifespan. And he focused his attention on um, that we go through stages of development based on how well our social and emotional needs are met. So this is looking how the social environment influences how we develop, right, over time. And you can see here, right here are the challenges. This is Eric Erickson. These are the challenges that he said were part of, or he predicted that were part of each sort of stage of life. So in infancy, you know, zero to one year, the child is completely vulnerable. Every need needs to be taken care of by somebody else. So the basic social question answered is, is the world going to be somebody in the world going to be there to take care of my need or not? And it develops a core sense of trust or mistrust based on whether the world is safe, comes and meets my need or not. And then in toddlerhood, one to two years, the child is starting to venture off. They can start to walk and they can start to, to wander off. So are they, are they encouraged in that exploration or are they too contained? And so they're left with a sense of doubt, right? Don't do that. Don't do that all the time right? Too much of that can instill insecurity and doubt. And then preschooler, three to five years, the social world starts to get a little bigger. The child can interact with others more, often goes to preschool, maybe kindergarten. And we have an extension of the same theme that runs through the next stages, which is that I, the feeling that I can do it or the feeling that I can't. So it's the same thing with initiative versus guilt. It's like, I'm going to give it a try or I, that's not something I can do. So you could think about it in, in our modern terms, we would think about this in terms of fixed or growth mindset, right? So does the child have the feeling that they can get better at something that they can try things out or do they have a withdrawal insecure response? And now they're dealing with a lot of social kids. So they do, do they feel competence in that social environment or do they feel inferior in that social environment? And then in adolescence, identity versus role confusion, trying to decide who I am and how I want to be. Um, young adulthood, intimacy versus isolation, making friends, developing networks. Middle adulthood, generativity versus stagnation, 40 to 60s. That means um, being productive, like finding work that you enjoy doing, trying to make a living, finding things that make a difference to you, feeling meaningful about your life or feeling stuck. And then integrity versus despair, meaning is later adulthood, late 60s and up, meaning feeling um, a sense of solidity about your life and your ability to continue to contribute or 
you know, spiraling into uh, depression. So, I mean, those are the extremes, right? And so a lot of times there's a lot of room in between those extremes and we can sort of put a lever and sort of go, where are we on that? And, you know, we can vacillate between these in Eric Erickson's time, as you can see here in 1950s, 40s, 50s, he's, you know, a senior in the 60s. Things were much more prescribed in terms of pathways. Now people have much more variety in their life path. And so we can go through these different kinds of like, you can um, experience going through a divorce in later life and experience this intimacy versus isolation. You can experience go through a pandemic and have to re, you know, retackle intimacy versus isolation as you come out of your home and re-emerge into the world and the need to develop some new connections and things like that. Um, people, it, for late adulthood, when partners lose spouses that pass on, they also need to develop new friendships and new connections, right? So it's not that we, we just stay in one place. Um, so we can vacillate between these. But the point is, is that what this is showing is that we're developing these kind of responses and feelings inside based on the social world is essentially the deal. So we can build that confidence now. This is one of the things that Rick Hansen really emphasizes that if we weren't, if we're all, you know, we all had like not exactly perfect backgrounds, right? Less than perfect backgrounds, because we live in a less than perfect world, surrounded by less than perfect people that interact with less than perfect us. <laughs> so because of that, we're all going to have these areas where we feel secure, insecure, this kind of thing, but we can build it. We can grow confidence just like we can grow everything else. It's a skill. We can build confidence by surrounding ourselves with supportive others and really taking in that support. And a great way to surround yourself with supportive others is to join a support group of some kind. And there are many different kinds of support groups through all kinds of organizations. Um, a club of people that do something similar to you and or, um, you know, meetups and things like that. So, and keep an eye out for the people that are positive goal-oriented and, so, so, and supportive. Now we're going to talk about attachment. And this is Mary Ainsworth. This is research also done in the 50s. And she did, she, Mary Ainsworth studied attachment, which is how secure we feel about intimacy with another, which is connecting with another and being vulnerable with, the, with another. She did this experiment with little children called the strange situation to kind of identify different kinds of attachment styles. And she came up with, you may have heard about this, secure and insecure attachment. And what she did, we don't really have time to watch the little video on it. You can go back and watch it. But what she did was she put a child in a room and the mother came in with the child. Let's say this is the mom came with the child and she'd sit down with the child in the room and then a visitor would come in like this lady did and start playing, you know, hang out and maybe try to play with the child. And then the mom would leave the room. Now they know that the kid will very likely express distress when they're young, this young, you know, a year and a half a year. Um, when the mom leaves the room, eight months to a year and a half, that they're gonna have separation anxiety. But what they were really watching for, well, what happens when the mom comes back? What does the child do when the mom comes back? Does the child go to the mom for support or does the child not go to the mom for support? Do they avoid the mom? So that, you know, that tells them that the child doesn't, hasn't developed the idea that the mom is a safe place to go to for support when they're distressed. And that can happen because mom is depressed. And so when the child was distressed, the mom didn't respond because the mom was dealing. So it can happen because of a reason that is not because the mom wants to be 
non-responsive. It can happen for all kinds of, the mom can be way over exhausted with too many kids. There can be all kinds of sort of faultless reasons for imperfect parenting. But the result is this thing that is referred to as insecure and secure attachment. And, and the idea is to be a good enough parent, not a perfect parent. So to respond often to these appeals, it's not like you have to be perfect. So with secure attachment, the caregivers were generally responsive, loving, and supportive, right? So they didn't get angry when the child was upset and get mad at the child, which would make the child withdraw. And they didn't um, ignore the child. And again, things like ignoring can happen for reasons that people, parents don't intend, uh, but they were able to be responsive to the child's needs, which takes a lot of high um, emotional development because it can be difficult to be around the upsetting emotions of children. So children absorb this sense that um, I'm worthy to have my needs met. And in insecure attachment, sometimes caregivers were not responsive on a regular basis. And we should say it'd be like 85% of the time or more responsive. And this is like 50% or less. So um, that can leave us leaving like we're not going to get our needs met. And Rick Hansen described this, and he went through that in childhood, not because of any intention on his parents' part, because of they didn't have the skills and they didn't have, um, they were stretched too thin emotionally with their own problems to be able to provide and offer that. But it still left him with what he describes as a hole in his heart. And so that is what he's been cultivating to fill by taking in the experiences that are joyful and loving now, now, and that you can build that are joyful and loving, right? So you can see the differences here in secure and insecure attachment, have a hard time being compassionate toward themselves, tend to either keep them their distance, not expect much or cling to other people or do the push me, pull you, come forward and then get scared and pull away. So when we do that, we, what we wanna do is stretch our ability to stay in the forward position and just grow it a little bit, stay in that connected position right? So we can change these things. We can change our attachment response patterns that we develop from childhood by becoming aware of them and then um, really nesting ourselves in some safe, solid relationships. And we can get coaching on developing those kinds of relationships if we need it with a counselor, which you have free counseling at Butte. And most counseling is short-term, by the way, and organized for a series of specific goals, you know, sort of like personal training, you go for a while. And then once you've got it figured out, you carry on on your own. A lot of it's like that. Um, and it's like coaching, life coaching in a way. So we can grow the inner security that we may have missed. Um, we can develop a greater sense of security in ourselves and in relationships in general especially if we really take in the deep moments. So we'll go through a few slides now on things we can do to grow confidence. One is learn to lean into effort, learn to love effort, reframe effort, like reframing pretty, right? We made pretty bigger, you know? Now it's not just, you know, looks in a narrow frame. We expanded the frame. <coughs> Now it's a big frame of, I'm going to be pretty amazing and pretty creative and pretty responsible and pretty, you know what I mean? It's a, it's, it's like a shape shift. That's what reframing is. And we, we really could use with reframing effort to leaning into it. A human likes to say, lean into the effort. Look at Sophocles even notice, right? So, so be willing, right? Be willing. <clears throat> so if you could write in the chat something that you would be willing, that takes you effort, that you'd be willing to lean into a little more with a little bit more appreciation, with a little bit of a shape shift, a new way of perceiving. And for me, it's going to be money. I have a, I, I just have a, um, a aversion to dealing with monetary things. So um, I'm going to lean into that. All right. So for your um, for your quiz points, 
what are some things that you would like to lean into the effort and not interpret that effort as something to pull away from, but rather lean into. Go ahead and drop some of those in the chat, or at least one of them in the chat for quiz points. Things that you are willing to lean into to embrace the effort that it takes, right? Rather than reject the effort. Instead, be willing to step into the effort, okay? Be willing to step into the effort. One of you wrote eating healthy up here. Um, I recently quit sugar. Well, not entirely, but like radically. And um, so that meant quitting sodas. And I really leaned into that I wasn't going to be as happy with iced tea than soda. I had to really lean into and accept that, right? I'm going to, it's just like, okay, you know? So, and it's a big thing to do that because that's one of the obstacles to us doing it is that we don't want to face the effort feeling. But if we can realize that the effort feeling is, is the grand growth place, right on. So add play. This is critical because we have to zoom out almost as much as we zoom in. So what's a dimension of your life that you would like to add play? And I'm going to do the same one. <laughs> it's the same one um, for me because I don't have to take this stuff so heavily or so seriously. I've got everything to do with money. I just got associated with drudgery. So I am going to add creativity and play to that. You know, one easy way to do it is with colored markers and post-its, right? And popcorn, right? So let your mind be creative about how you can add play. What are some dimensions of your life where you need to add some play? That you're getting too stuck, caught up, too limited in your thinking, too serious, to maybe with particular people in your life. So throw that into the chat, right? What would you like to add some lightness to, some playfulness to? Maybe a bit of a different approach. Throw that in the chat. What would you like to add play to? Insert play. I'd like to add some play to cooking. Yes, anything to do with school is a good one. Really? I fucking snub my studying. Good one. Studying is a good one. Let's add some play. So you can brainstorm ways to add play to that. You could be creative about how you could add play. The next one is to notice when we feel cared about, really noticing it rather than just taking it for granted or not paying attention to it, becoming mindful of when we feel cared about. This is a really great exercise um, just to notice, like a lot of times we pass off this stuff, but notice when somebody gives you a call, notice when somebody smiles at you right? We can grow a core sense of feeling valued, liked, and loved as a step at a time by noticing when people express interest in us, when they express empathy, when they express re respect. We can notice the five forms of caring, and we can also express the five forms of caring, feeling included, seen, appreciated, liked, and loved. And another is help others securely attach to us. And they securely can feel secure about us when we're dependable, empathic, and caring on a consistent basis, right? When we come through for them regularly, we can regularly make that commitment and we can actively cultivate the five to one relationship ratio. Another concept here is don't throw darts. 
So there's this idea of the first and second dart. And the first dart is stuff that happens that we don't want to happen, which often happens, right? This is kind of the Tao of life, right? And the second dart is our reactions and judgments. It's the temper tantrum that our default mode network goes on about how we're pissed off that the printer broke and stuff. And, and this is an automatic reaction process. We are automatically designed to get frustrated with goal frustration right? And they want to get rid of that barrier with the frustration, but we don't have to react. Uh, we don't have to feel crappy. Like we can notice that this is a barrier and that we're going to work with it toward a new solution in a gentler way than negative reactions. <clears throat> so second dart rumination is the story we tell ourselves when these things happen, right? Like, and that story can go down a really sort of spiral down disempowering path. Like, why does this always happen to me? I hate it when this happens. This is driving me crazy. And when we notice ourselves feeling that way, we can begin by taking a breath. Open up, open your heart, lift your chest to the sky and release. And we can let go of those second darts. So that's a practice, letting go of second darts. Um, the second dart is somebody cuts you off in traffic and then um, first dart is somebody cuts you off in traffic, annoying. Second dart is spending 20 minutes angry about it, right? So we want to subvert that 20 minutes angry about it. Here we have spilled milk, right? And getting all upset over spilled milk. So we can think about first dart experiences that we have that we would like to have a better second dart reaction, <laughs> right? Where we don't want to um, keep being like as we don't want to react that upset and people often put road rage down on here or getting angry at other drivers but it's it's there's lots of them that you'll notice right so you'll notice times when you get a little bit upset and this is all related to the idea of don't let this sweat the small stuff right just throw it in the trash let it go <clears throat> release it as quickly as you can. And Rick's let be, let go, let in process is a really great process for releasing attachments. This kid is completely let bead the spilled milk, let go and let in <laughs> what's enjoyable about it, right? So, so we can relax a little bit. Let go means literally relaxing. So let's take a breath in, open our shoulders. Breathe out. And let's just relax some tension in our shoulders, in our jaw, in our cheeks, in our eyes, right? That's, that's literally physically letting go. And I also like to feel like a spaciousness in my body so emotions can kind of flow on and out. And then the third part is letting in letting in what is useful, hopeful, and enjoyable about things. So if we don't fuel second darts, if we don't go, if we don't start a, a thought ruminating, that guy was such a jerk, how could he do that? As a, if we don't spin, if we catch that spin and sort of let it go, then the second dart reactions tend to fizzle on their own, right? So we can have perspective on first starts in relationships. We can understand that being sensitive to others is part of our evolutionary wiring. We can be gentle with ourselves. So this is why compassion really helps with taking criticism or whatever, because if we can feel like we're gonna stand by our side and hold our own shoulder while we're listening to something difficult, we'll be there for ourselves, then we've got a stable ground with which to attend to that something difficult, right? If we don't have enough stable ground, we can't stand it, right? Because we'll, we'll be toppled over. So another thing is to push back and retrain our inner critic. We're almost done here, you guys. I'm sorry about going over. Um, the inner critic is a major thrower of second darts. This is the negative inner voice. And we want to transform that inner voice into an inner ally. I am the greatest. I said it even before I knew I was Muhammad Ali. Athletes are urged to develop self-talk scripts that can target one or more specific needs using a variety of self-talk types, as well as the more general guidelines outlined in the smart talk commandments. So 
phrases that we can say to ourselves that we have identified and put in our toolbox in our pocket that we can turn to okay that we that we come up with that we can begin to replace the negative thoughts with right so you know i'm such an idiot i can't believe i did that we recognize when that when our mind says that and say i hear you i hear you and at the same time that was really difficult and i know i can do it better next time here's what we need to do right so we turn into an inner coach instead of an inner critic instead of i'm not good at this what am i missing or how can i get better i'm on the right track i give up i'll use some of the strategies we'll learn i'll reach out to other people and see if we can brainstorm some ideas this is too hard this may take some time and effort but i got this i'm willing to put the effort in right so we change the self talk and it's really helpful to come up with some like notice what your own mind is saying and and identify some specific things if you can't come up with ones on your own look for positive self talk phrases in on google and you will find all kinds of ones to select from so this is going to be part of our assignment and that is to appreciate even celebrate our strengths. So we we talked earlier about things that we genuinely appreciate about ourselves and this week in the assignment there's a quiz called the strengths test and this was designed by Martin Seligman who developed positive psychology from learned helplessness to learned optimism, right? And I started talking to you about this and we'll talk more about it next week after you take the strengths test. But what the strengths test will do, it's a free test, so don't do anything that costs money. You can go on and spend money, but you're gonna get what you need for this assignment in, um, in the free test. And that's the top five signature strengths. These are five things that you're great at, that you've already mastered, that you're really, really good at. And we'll talk more about how you can use those strengths next week, but we want to live those strengths and make them part of our daily lives, because that's part of what instills a sense of deep confidence. Practice self-compassion. We're all trying, we're all struggling, we're all making mistakes, we're all feeling hard emotions, including you, so be kind to you strengthens our ability to be kind to others. So if you could put in the chat, and this will be one of the closing questions, because I think we only have one more slide, but what is one way that you can be kind to yourself today? What is one way you can be kind to yourself today? And I am writing down, include some play. You can just let the answer spontaneously arrive for you because I've been spending a lot of days doing a lot of work. And so today I wanna to include some play. So what are what is one way that you can be kind to yourself today? Please write your answer in the chat as the closing question. And then the last slide, next to last slide is connect with your inner truth. And this is a really good one. <laughs> I'm with you on the retail therapy. This is a really good one. Um, because you want your being to feel that you will be there for you. That's how you can deal with hard things. So one way to do that is to check in often. How do I really feel about that? You know, and I really like to encourage people that when somebody asks you, what do you want to do? Just don't say whatever you want to do. You can say that, but, but also check in and go, what do I really want to do? And it may take a little while for that to surface. You know, you may have to play with some ideas, right? But you'll discover it. And this is how you feel like you are there for you. You know, how do I really feel about this? Check in, check in. It doesn't mean you have to act on that, right? I don't feel right about that, but I'm just going to not get involved or whatever. It doesn't mean you have to push anything out or say anything. You just want to be self-aware. You want to be touching base and checking in. So regularly checking in about how do I really feel about that? How do I feel? What would I really like? What really matters to me? Asking these self-awareness questions, questions like this one. What is one way I can be kind to myself today? This is us teaching our own being that we will be there for us. And that's what enables us to be get through the hard times and feel strong. All right. So believe in yourself, everybody. Thank you for coming here today. 
I love what you wrote here. Oh, watch that new Dune movie. Yes. Self-care with some face masks. Yes. These are all great. Take time to relax. I hope you do these things. Go get that cup of coffee. 